I, I've known Lucina for many, many years. I believe I was even, even on her committee for the C paper when she was a grad student in psychology. Um, and I was on her doctoral committee. And I always brag about this. The very first brain imaging study she did was in my lab. Um, and she, I remember she said something like this, Marco, while she was running the study, um, acquiring data, analyzing data, she said that at some point, Marco, I never worked this hard in my whole life. And I guess she enjoyed it because she never stopped. Um, and she's been very successful. Uh, she had a beautiful dissertation and we all thought that she would be a star in the near sense of uh, self-recognition. And at some point she tells me, you know what, for my postdoc, I want to join Javier Castellanos and do resting state. And I thought, what? Why resting state? At that time, resting state was such a tiny field. And I thought, that thing is not going to go anywhere. Boy, I was wrong. I was so wrong. <laughs> and even though resting state became such a booming thing, she's one of the best um, scholars and scientists in the field. And that's because she's really good at doing pretty much everything she does. Uh, she moved to uh, New York first, then she went to Stanford, uh, um, been there for a few years, and then she opened her own lab at the University of Miami, um, a very thriving, successful lab. But she never forgot UCLA, and we never forgot Lucina. And it's like a love story of two lovers that eventually finally get reunited. And Lucina is finally back with us. She joined uh, the faculty here at UCLA, reinforcing both the neuroimaging and the neuroscience community. And uh, we are very pleased to have her here. And I'll just shut up here. And uh, oh, I want to say one thing. Um, Lucina, do you want um, people to interrupt you during the talk, or you prefer just the questions in the Q&A part? Uh, whatever people prefer is fine with me. I, I love for it to be interactive, so I don't mind at all. OK, she doesn't mind it, so you know that. Uh, why don't you go ahead and tell us uh, what you want to talk about today? Okay, and thank you uh, very much for inviting me to the Brain Mapping Seminar. I used to attend it as a student, as a student of Marco and Morella and Ron Zidel and, and uh, Matt Lieberman in psychology. It's just, it's just hilarious and, and humbling to be back 15 years later uh, in this capacity. Um, anyone who knows me knows that, you know, it's always been kind of my dream to come back to UCLA. So this is just uh, basically a dream come true. So I'm, I'm so happy that I'm here. I feel physically be there starting next week. Um, happy to have the support of these mentors. Really, as you can see, there's these lifelong mentors that you get from uh, training at UCLA. They follow you, they write letters for you your whole life, and then they welcome you back um, when, it's, when the time is right. And so I'm really just lucky to have had that support and the continued support. Um, and I can't wait to be able to pay it forward to the UCLA community um, in the years to come, hopefully. So um, as, as Marco mentioned, I took a bunch of crazy career risks and started off in directions that no one thought would be fruitful. Um, one of them was resting state fMRI back in 2006 when folks still thought everything was noise and we should never be looking at the brain in the absence of task. Um, so it's, it's really um, fun to, to come back to you now and, and tell you some of the things we have actually learned over the years um, using network neuroscience approaches. Um, in particular, we've focused a lot on brain dynamics and flexible behaviors over the last couple, uh, uh, I guess, five, 10 years in my lab. Um, so I'll share with you some of those findings today. And please do feel free to jump in, you know, in, in any uh, form, format you like uh, to ask questions. And so um, mainly I just uh, usually talk about flexibility and why it's important and how it's associated with uh, optimal life outcomes. But um, you know, here I usually start with this cute picture of a kid who uh, is trying to on a pair of socks. Um, and a lot of times we, we know that uh, children with autism spectrum disorder have difficulties with flexible behaviors. They might want to wear a particular type of clothing or only eat a specific kind of food or um, just really have have a challenge with um, you know, meeting the demands of a changing environment. Um, but now I think we all struggle with flexibility. This last year and a half of the pandemic has showed us just how important it, it is to be able to change your direction and change your way of doing things. Um, you know, we're giving talks from our living rooms instead of from uh, podiums in front of an audience and you know, everything has changed and we've had to adapt alongside it. So I don't need to really explain why um, understanding flexibility and how it's implemented in the brain is really um, critical. 
we, um, overall in the lab, we like to study how brain networks develop across the lifespan um, and how they support cognitive maturation and cognitive development across childhood, adolescence into adulthood. Uh, and also what are the consequences of atypical development um, you know, within or between large scale brain networks. This is a really nice um, figure that Megan Meyer uh, made and I stole many years ago. Um, so a lot of the, the things I'm showing you are of course other people's work as always, but I just think it's a cute demonstration of how um, you know, brain systems we know are changing across the lifespan and really trying to understand those trajectories I think can give us important insights into neurodevelopmental conditions in particular. And uh, so what we do is we study typical adults, we study um, typically developing kids and clinical populations using a multimodal neuroimaging approach combining structural and functional task and rest fMRI and um, also some computational approaches and causal modeling. And um, in sort of the, the background of everything we do are these foundational concepts from network neuroscience. And uh, even though we, we think of you know, fMRI as one of the most useful tools for studying the human brain in vivo, there have been these concepts about the brain um, conceptualized as a network that really predate common neuroimaging techniques. So there's a nice paper from Eslam back in 1990 where he talks about how cognition is served by interconnected neural networks and that cognitive behavior, uh, complex behavior is mapped at the level of multifocal neural systems rather than specific anatomical sites. So even from the neuropsychological and lesion studies um, you know, that predate modern fMRI, we, we knew that there was this kind of network structure um, that it was important to understand um, when we talk about brain function and dysfunction. And there's a lot of computational work. Um, there's uh, particularly like this paper from Randy McIntosh where he talks about uh, the concept of neural context. And that's the idea that the functional relevance of a brain region depends on the status of other interconnected brain regions. I think this is particularly important to note as we look at a particular set of nodes, like in A might be behaving in, a, in one way um, in the context of the, the black nodes that are coactive, but may behave in a completely different way in a different context as depicted in B. And finally, we need to understand this concept of time, um, the idea that uh, the brain, whoops, needs to be um, understood in terms of uh, the interactions that unfold temporarily. And I think we've seen, um, you know, I think people who do EEG maybe have been more aware of this fact over the years because they really work more in the time domain. But in fMRI, we're starting to catch on that we can, we can also look at how signals unfold over time and what that tells us about uh, the nature of cognition. And um, back when Barack Biswal first noted in 1995 that there was these spontaneous coherent fluctuations um, in brain systems, we did sort of dismiss this as noise, but um, over subsequent years, we realized that this spontaneous low frequency activity is coherent within systems that recapitulate language, attention, networks, uh, memory networks. Uh, all the things you see in a cognitive task can also be um, pulled out from these uh, low frequency coherent fluctuations in the brain. We can kind of exploit this property of resting state fMRI to understand the integrity um, and the maturation of large scale brain networks. So exploiting it is what we've been doing. Um, and if there's one sort of silver lining to the pandemic is that I finally had time to write all the reviews that I agreed to write before the pandemic. But um, one of them, I was particularly interested in uh, thinking about how the field has conceptualized flexibility, both in human studies and in animal work um, using things like the Wisconsin cards or test or um, reversal learning and animal models. And this has allowed us to really pinpoint some of the neural systems and networks that are really critical for this type of, of flexible behavior. Um, and this other review on the right um, really highlights some of the, the, the nodes of key networks that are important um, uh, generally for flexibility, but also uh, specifically in, in autism spectrum disorder. This was part of a special issue that, that came out last year. So these are for the, the folks who want just uh, an overview of the field. Um, what we've done in the lab is try to think of ways to study flexibility that are, you know, as ecologically valid as possible, but still, um, you know, experimental. And so we took a task from the developmental psych literature that many of you will probably recognize, and it's called the flexible item selection task. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, one of these variations where you ask people to choose two things that go together in one way. So um, they may choose, uh, for example, the two things that are blue, 
But then you ask them to pick two other things that go together in one way. So they may pick uh, the two rabbits, two cards that are depicting rabbits, for example. Um, and the scanner, we actually had to come up with a control condition, you know, that matched the visual and motor properties. And so we were um, basically asking people to just follow along and press the buttons corresponding to the highlighted squares here. So they would press these buttons and then some more buttons and, and some more buttons. Um, so this was your, you know, sort of classic cognitive neuroscience uh, task paradigm to look at flexible behaviors. And if you ask adults to do this, um, they can do it pretty well, you know, put them in the scanner, ask them to, to complete four runs of this. We did some validation of, you know, uh, whether they were performing similarly inside and outside of the scanner in terms of accuracy. And we were able to get um, a combined accuracy, reaction time and efficiency measure to show that people get better with the task over time. Now, um, my student Dina Dejani at the time um, ran this, you know, uh, and, and you can see the activations for flexibility minus control trials are as you would expect in frontal parietal regions, fear frontal, you know, gyrus in particular, basal ganglia, um, insula, and anterior cingulate and cerebellar regions are activated really robustly when people are asked to perform this task. And what's interesting is that <laughs> these regions are activated robustly across all kinds of executive functions. So if you look on the left, these are just some neurosynth uh, meta-analyses of the terms shifting, updating, and inhibition, which are thought to be main executive function components um, or latent variables describing uh, different executive components that are related but separable. And of course, all these brain regions are active across all, all manner of this type of task. So there's um, you know, maybe not so much specificity here for, uh, for flexibility per se. Um, but what we did in that study was use this approach called group iterative multiple model estimation to look at um, relationships between these different nodes and how they sort of uh, relate to each other. And in that study, um, this gave us some evidence that the inferior frontal junction was particularly important for this type of task. In fact, um, you know, it, it uh, sort of um, is the one that's activated um, primarily by the flexibility trials and the other regions are, are more involved in other aspects of executive function for this task. So we did all of this in order to have uh, something to, to put in the scanner um, in terms of looking at typical development, but also eventually kids with, with autism. So in, in typical development, another branch of our lab looks at development of brain networks that underlie flexibility using lifespan approaches. So here we can look at ages six to 85, for example, and see how things like brain signal variability changes across the, the lifespan in specific brain areas. In other work, we, we use causal modeling or diffusion imaging to look at effective connectivity and structural connectivity between key network nodes and how they change from childhood to adulthood. And um, in addition, we uh, look at things like how networks um, change across the lifespan. So um, we have uh, studies, again, of like six to 85 year olds using publicly available databases like the Nathan Klein Institute, where we can look at um, relationships between networks and how some uh, relationships strengthen, some weaken um, from childhood through older age. So when we tried to do this flexible item selection uh, task in children, we, we you know, got what we would expect, which is, um, the activation in the frontal parietal regions, the insula and the ACC. And um, wait one sec, please. Dangers of trying to give a talk at home. So can you hear me? OK. So um, basically, we're uh, trying to do this task in kids who are um, between the ages of 9 and 12. And they do activate a lot of the same brain regions that we see um, for, uh, they're activated in adults. And uh, Lauren Kupis in the lab is working on this right now. But uh, one downside of doing imaging is that, um, as many of you probably experienced, you can't really do this during a pandemic. So we had um, basically in March, 2020, a uh, you know, stopping of data collection, and we were not able to go ahead and continue this study and collect data from children with autism, which was the ultimate goal. Um, so we didn't reach our target enrollment numbers at all. Um, and to make things worse, we had actually submitted a registered report where we said, you know, we're going to collect this number of subjects, we're going to do this task, we're going to follow this analytic plan. Um, and we had submitted that registered report and it was accepted. But now we're supposed to submit stage two, which is the final analysis and the final results. 
And as you can imagine, it's not a very uh, impressive stage two registered report because we have about half the number of subjects we initially said we would. So um, I thought I would just start off with a, a story of pandemic disappointment that maybe many of you can relate to um, in your own research, because I think this has affected all of us. But um, what we do know is that cognitive flexibility involves coordination among brain regions um, that support executive function and that both children and adults uh, engage lateral frontal parietal and mid cingulo insular networks during flexible item selection. And um, that task modulated connectivity of the inferior frontal junction in particular, we think uh, occurs in the service of flexible behaviors of the, of the type that I just showed you. Um, so usually I say, well, stay tuned for our data from children with autism. And now I know that that data is gonna be definitely abbreviated um, compared with what we initially thought we'd be, we'd be collecting. So uh, in parallel with these um, you know, developmental and clinical studies, we also try to just look at uh, the neurotypical adult populations and identify some of the neural circuits that we think are important for flexibility. Um, and we can do this uh, using several different um, recently developed approaches for examining brain dynamics. In one um, sort of sliding window approach, what you can do is take whether you have 10 or 20 minutes of resting state fMRI data, but break it down into smaller chunks, either 30 or 60 second windows. And instead of looking at the whole brain connectivity matrix act, averaged over that entire window, you're looking at uh, shorter windows and looking at how changes um, from moment to moment can be, uh, can be quantified. And so things like k-means clustering can be used to identify uh, different connectivity states. And then you can go ahead and look at metrics like the frequency of occurrence or how many times a particular state uh, shows up across the 10 minute scan. And you can look at dwell time, how long does a state persist once it shows up? And you can look at transitions between states. Uh, that is, you know, how often do you see switches between different whole brain configurations? So um, Jason Nomi in the lab a number of years ago took advantage of the Human Connectome Project. At the time, it was just a few hundred subjects but these subjects each had an hour of resting state fMRI data. So many, many, many time points that we can see that we can use to really get a good characterization of, of uh, moment to moment dynamics. Um, and these subjects, as you know, also had performed a whole bunch of tasks outside of the scanner, some of which we were particularly um, keen to investigate. And what he found back then was that um, those subjects who spent uh, sort of, or who had more frequent occurrences of this loosely connected brain state that you see here, state one, and fewer occurrences of state five, which is a highly connected uh, brain state. Um, those were the subjects who were performing better on working memory, as well as performing better on tasks of cognitive flexibility that were uh, conducted outside of the scanner. So um, in, in that initial study, we, we found that greater cognitive flexibility um, is associated with the propensity to occupy these more frequently occurring sort of loose, looser brain configurations characterized by attenuated correlations and greater functional connectivity variability. And this was our first kind of foray, foray into how dynamic functional connectivity can be used to look at relationships between brain dynamics and flexible cognition. So we, you know, what I showed you before was sort of a data-driven uh, whole brain approach to understanding um, relationships with cognitive flexibility and brain dynamics. But over the years, we've worked on this model of neurocognitive network dynamics that really um, looks at some of the ubiquitous systems. And these are systems that if you're an fMRI researcher, you see them pop up a lot in your data. So things like what the so-called default mode or medial frontal parietal network with key nodes in the ventromedial prefrontal and cluster cingulate cortex and then of course, lateral frontal parietal or executive networks with um, key areas of activation in um, uh, lateral prefrontal and lateral parietal cortices. And then the mid cingulate insular or salience network with key areas in the anterior cingulate and dorsal anterior insula. And what we've done over the last few years is think about how these networks interact with each other because we often see antagonistic relationships between default mode and executive control but we also see that um, the salience network uh, can actually act as a dynamic switch between um, activations uh, of the other two networks. Um, you can oftentimes predict what's going to happen in the other networks based on what's happening uh, in terms of activation in the anterior insula 
and it temporarily tends to precede what's happening in some of those other networks as well. So this is um, the initial figure from this paper was a, a paper with the node Menon in 2010 that's now been cited like 4,000 times. And, but this figure is much prettier than that figure. So I always show this one instead and, and warn people that you should make nice figures because you might, your best cited paper might have horrible figures in it. So uh, as a warning to yourself, pay attention to your figures. Um, so, uh, but in terms of uh, thinking about these three networks and how they might be related to flexibility more broadly, uh, one of my um, current graduate students, Lauren Kupis, who was over, she was able to transfer over from Miami and is now in the neuroscience IDP program at UCLA. She took a look at this publicly available data set, the Nathan Klein Institute, that really conveniently has 600 subjects aged between six and 85. Um, and also these subjects have performed the Dallas Kaplan executive function um, neuropsych test, which um, you know, basically participants are asked to uh, count from you know, one to I forget what the number is, but you know, go basically switching between the letters of the alphabet and the numbers, and it's a pretty challenging cognitive flexibility task. And um, she used a different uh, approach called coactivation pattern analysis to look at brain dynamics um, that uses more of a time point by time point um, uh, way to characterize uh, brain states, um, but still similar to sliding window, you can um, calculate things like dwell time, uh, frequency of occurrence, and transitions between states. I'm happy to talk more about methods uh, as well if anyone is interested. Um, but what she was, she specifically focused on the, you know, the default salience and executive networks and found some interesting lifespan um, trajectories. Uh, this one paper just came out a couple months ago, I think. Um, but she found, for example, this one state that's characterized by coactivation between executive and default mode nodes shows this U-shaped trajectory where it sort of occurs a lot in the middle of life, but not as much early in life and less so than later in life. And what's interesting is if you look at relationships with the cognitive flexibility to behavior, um, it, it, there was an interesting relationship there with number of transitions. Um, and basically she found that being of the middle age years, the brain state transitions don't influence that much the, uh, the, the individual differences in, in um, uh, in the task. But if you look at early age and young age, uh, a having more transitions between brain states is associated with better performance on that um, cognitive flexibility task that was conducted outside the scanner. So how your brain can sort of flexibly adapt um, to challenges uh, may obviously differ as a function of your age. And in, um, in early life and in later life, there seems to be sort of a more of a com compensatory effect of number of transitions between states, which is, I guess, nice that we can figure that out, like how to still perform well in old age. So, um, so this kind of suggests, we see here that the frequency of coactivation patterns involving lateral frontal parietal and medial frontal parietal networks changes across the lifespan in interesting ways. Um, and transitions between states, we think support cognitive flexibility in different ways at different stages of the lifespan. Um, and this is the part where I kind of do a deep dive into the insular cortex because it's one of those brain regions that is ubiquitous. It just shows up in task activation studies in almost every kind of paradigm. And you'll see it in the table of uh, activated coordinates in every paper almost, even though people don't always um, really think about what its function might be. Uh, it's you know, tucked away there um, you know, uh, inside the brain. And it shows up in studies of, uh, you know, in the affective domain, like emotion, empathy, and pain. You often hear about insula activation in, in those kinds of paradigms. But it's also <clears throat> very much implicated in subjective awareness, interoception, and somatosensation, and surprisingly, maybe um, in high-level cognitive processes like cognitive switching, attention, and inhibition. Uh, you, you just see this kind of um, brain region showing up across this wide range of, of domains. So if you look at closely at the insular cortex, it perhaps not surprisingly can be subdivided into functional divisions anywhere from two to 27, depending on who you ask. In some of these earlier studies, um, uh, people used um, basically a parcellation using resting state fMRI data. So clustering voxels that are similar uh, based on their whole brain connectivity patterns. And they found evidence for at least three to subdivisions, a dorsal anterior, a ventral anterior, and a posterior. And I wouldn't say that, I mean, there's no right way to know what the 
what the actual number of clusters is in anything. This is just a clustering problem, but there's uh, some you know, repl replicability to these three um, subdivisions. So I'm just showing them here. And uh, what, what uh, Luke Chang and his colleagues found on the left was that when you see the, um, the ventral anterior insula activated across tasks, it's usually in uh, using meta-analytic approaches, he showed that it's usually across studies in the affective area, you know, with, with terms like emotion, anxiety, et cetera. And what I did on the right here was a co-activation uh, connectivity modeling analysis, which is basically asking the question, when the ventral anterior insula is active, what other brain regions tend to be co-active? Um, and so uh, basically it just shows limbic regions tend to be co-active when you see this subdivision of the insula uh, come online. Um, and the next column here just shows um, the dorsal anterior insula and on the left is the terms that are most associated with activation there, switching, conflict, inhibition. Um, and on the right is our co-activation meta-analysis showing that frontoparietal regions tend to be co-active with the dorsal anterior insula. And the posterior insula tends to be the one most associated with pain and somatosensory processes. And on the right, it shows uh, greater co-activation with sensory motor cortices. So we're starting to see that there's, um, you know, this insula area isn't a monolith and, and there's areas within there that um, perhaps have different functions. But at the same time, the entire set of these subdivisions does appear to be active to some extent across all the different cognitive domains that we um, looked at. So there does seem to be this functional convergence in addition to this specificity. So um, my uh, colleague, Jason Nomi, started to look at this question in terms of dynamics. So perhaps there's just different ways that the insula interacts with the rest of the brain. And if you look moment to moment, you can um, tease this apart. And the long story short here is that there are some brain states in which the different insula subdivisions appear very similar in how they talk to the rest of the brain. But there's other states that occur less frequently, like state two, in which they diverge in terms of how they interact with other cortical regions. And in fact, the most interesting finding, I think, from this study was that the dorsal anterior insula was the one that was the most different, the most flexible in terms of its relationships with other uh, parts of the brain. So from state to state, the dorsal anterior insula was more uh, unique in its um, activity or connectivity. Um, so Will Snyder was an undergrad who worked with us uh, for a summer and now is a Gates scholar and starting his PhD. And he was interested in looking at how the dynamics of this um, interesting area change across the lifespan using that same NKI sample of 600 subjects, six to 85 years of age. And I won't go into all of these cool findings. Um, it's in a paper that just came out this year. But there was one state, state four, which is a, a state of relative isolation of the insula ACC network. Um, and that particular state, um, just showing you here, uh, you know, changed a lot in terms of its uh, relationship with age. So there were um, sort of th this salience isolated state showed up a lot longer in young children and in old age, but was um, that, that particular um, uh, salience network connectivity state was not there as often in the, in the middle age. So there's a lot of results in this particular study that I'm not gonna get into, but I just think it's really interesting that dynamics of this really critical network um, you know, change with age in ways we're just starting to realize. Um, and uh, other work we do looks at structural connections of the, these different subdivisions. And not surprisingly, again, there are some unique things that the dorsal anterior insula does in terms of its um, structural connections with frontal and um, thalamic and other brain regions. So this was, you know, you can tell it's my favorite brain region. So I spent a good 10 minutes talking about it, but we think um, you can probably see why there's a lot of interesting things that can be um, learned about from, from studying insular function and dysfunction. And um, we think in adults, you can at least see a dorsal anterior, a ventral anterior and a posterior subdivision with um, a dorsal anterior more involved in the high level cognitive control types of executive function processes, the ventral anterior more involved in emotion and affect, and the posterior more involved in sensation and pain. Uh, we think that this salience slash mid single insular network, the dynamics um, show complex maturational changes across the lifespan. And what's interesting, I think, about the dorsal anterior insula is that it has the most variable functional connections and unique 
structural connections that perhaps enable functional flexibility. Um, and in fact, the, the network model that I showed you earlier, it's really the dorsal anterior insula that shows a causal influence on the uh, um, executive and default mode networks. And in fact, when I've done causal analyses using other nodes of the insula, I haven't found the same causal influence effect. So there's really something uh, unique about what the dorsal anterior insula appears to be doing. And this was another COVID delayed project, but um, basically we, we, we know that the fMRI responses are slow and um, the best we can do in humans is intracranial recording from patients who are being monitored for epilepsy. And a lot of groups have begun to use this really fine temporal precision to look at network dynamics on a shorter scale. Um, so I had an ongoing collaboration um, with folks at Western University. What's great about their neurosurgical unit is that they um, routinely plant depth electrodes along the insula, sometimes doing as much as three uh, depth electrodes, as you can see here in anterior, mid and posterior segments of the insula. Um, and of course they do that to monitor epilepsy, but when I realized that they are doing this anyway, I thought this was a great way to test some of our theories about insular subdivision specificity and timing um, and network dynamics. So I gosh, I think we started this collaboration like three years ago now, but we're unable to collect data um, due to the pandemic. But someday, someday we will um, be coming back with some data to show that I hope will be going along with some of the fMRI findings that I've shown you so far. Um, so in the last part of the talk, I will just touch on some of the uh, clinical populations that we are interested in applying a lot of this network neuroscience, um, uh, you know, modeling approaches to. And we do focus a lot on um, neurodevelopmental disorders, autism spectrum disorder in particular. I was um, really fortunate to have uh, Marella DePreto as one of my dissertation advisors because she uh, took a chance and allowed me to do my first imaging study on kids with autism while I was uh, still um, doing my PhD. And that really got me started thinking about the disorder and thinking about how we can use neuroimaging to better understand it. So that was a, a great start. Um, in the years since, I've become more interested in, uh, in addition to you know, the social communication uh, deficits in the disorder, I've been, become more interested in the executive function um, deficits. And I think what's really interesting and most people don't realize is that as kids with autism grow up to be adults with autism, they, they still, they often have these poor outcomes like not being able to live independently um, and having um, high rates of unemployment. And this is compared with other intellectual disabilities and learning disabilities. The outcomes um, seem to be poorer, even if you look at those individuals of high IQ. And I think there's a lot of reasons for this, but I, um, as I mentioned throughout, flexibility is one of those things that's really associated with good outcomes academically and with employment and um, independent living. Uh, so, um, you know, if you have difficulty with flexibility in daily life, you can imagine these transitions to adulthood are particularly uh, challenging, um, you know, gaining employment for the first time or moving to college, things like that. Um, so there are a lot of uh, behavioral treatments that have shown to be effective in uh, enhancing flexible behaviors. Um, it's not always clear exactly who will stand to benefit the most from this. Uh, something we've been thinking a lot about is heterogeneity, because of course not all individuals with, who are fall under a particular diagnosis show the same symptom profile or the same uh, you know, profile of deficits and strengths. So one of my students um, did a latent profile analysis on a, this very big sample. Um, this included kids in the seven to 12 year old age range, but those who are diagnosed with autism, those who are diagnosed with ADHD, another really prevalent neurodevelopmental condition, um, those who had both comorbid autism and ADHD and those who are typically developing. And what she found is that if you look at parent report behavior rating inventory of executive function scores, you can um, find three classes of individuals, three classes of children uh, with differing EF executive function profiles. And not every child with a disorder um, shows impaired executive function. In fact, if you look at this average EF pie, these are people who score in the average range, there's a mix of kids with different disorders. So it's not clear that you know, having a diagnosis is always gonna be associated with this deficit. Uh, and my uh, honors thesis uh, student, Adriana Baez, can, 
completed a replication of this finding. And then again, if you look at the middle average executive function group here, there's 30% you know, of that group is kids with autism. So those are the kids who don't seem to be affected in the executive function domain. Um, so this heterogeneity, we think, uh, might be in part due to individual differences in brain dynamics. Um, you know, as we suggested before, there's some evidence that transitions between brain states has something to do with, uh, with individuals' flexible behaviors. And so our first um, prediction was that just we might see reductions in the number of transitions between brain states and autism. So that was the first thing that Jason Nomi did in the lab, looking at some uh, publicly available data sets. Um, and just using the sliding window approach, finding some evidence for, oh, at the whole brain level, reductions in the number of brain state transitions uh, being related to uh, uh, differentiating the uh, individuals with autism from the typically developing individuals. And Emily Marshall, another honors thesis student in the lab, looked specifically at the salience network or mid single insular network for all the reasons I've told you about so far, we, we care very uh, much about this set of brain regions. Um, and she found that there was one coactivation pattern in particular where uh, the network is linked up with the other two, the central executive and default. Um, and that coactivation pattern actually occurred less frequently in the kids with um, autism compared to the typically developing kids in this pretty large sample that was pooled across a few different sites. Um, so um, both Lauren and Bryce in our lab were also looking at not just resting state dynamics, but task related dynamics of these networks. So uh, this is one of those tasks from the developmental psych literature again, where um, kids are just asked to point to the thing that's different, whether it's uh, different based on shape or different based on color. And in mixed blocks, they're switching between color and shape. And those are slightly more challenging because they're uh, asked to you know, switch between different attributes there. Um, kids with autism can do this pretty easily, however, um, so we were just interested in how the brain dynamics kind of support this, this particular type of flexibility. Um, so here, uh, Lauren actually looked at nodes of the salience, nodes of the executive, and modes, nodes of the default mode network, and how they co-activate uh, you know, across the period of this task, as well as during resting state. And since the kids could do this really well, there actually wasn't too much in terms of brain dynamic differences until you get to the fourth run of the task where we actually saw that um, they more frequently engage the lateral frontal parietal coactivation pattern compared to the typically developing kids in order to main, maintain the same level of behavioral performance. So um, these are just kind of examples of ways we think that dynamic functional connectivity approaches can be used to reveal atypical patterns of brain dynamics in prevalent neurodevelopmental conditions characterized by cognitive inflexibility. And the extent to which these brain dynamics are related to individual differences in flexible behaviors is something, of course, that we're very interested in and, and um, is a topic of ongoing investigation. Uh, this is a book that I wrote a few years ago um, but now I'm involved in this OHBM uh, best practices group in order to try to come up with some consistent nomenclature for the field. So we've, um, we've used terms like default mode network or salience network or attention network throughout, but different people use these terms in different ways to, to refer to different anatomical regions and systems. So our first attempt in a collaboration with Thomas Yeo and Nathan Spring was to try to standardize the way we talk about these brain regions and networks. And we, so we put out this paper. Um, I don't know if anyone paid attention to it. It was two years ago, but now I'm part of a larger group of about 26 of us who meet monthly to try to hash out these terms and what they mean, and what is a network and how do we define it and what should we report? So we're trying to get to something like a covid report where we have the, that's the Committee on Best Practices and Data Analysis and Sharing. We're trying to get that kind of a document together where we'll make some recommendations for the field to try to come up with a taxonomy that will help us speak the same language as, as researchers. So I say this just to point out that I, I wish I had named this the mid singular insular network of the human brain, because I think that focusing on anatomy helps us um, at least find a common ground, because we, you and I may differ on what we think a particular function of a network is, but we probably could agree that it involves X brain regions um, if, we, if we get sit in a room and are forced to agree on it. So this is something I'm currently working on um, 
and we'll stay tuned for the, the paper that describes our final um, recommendations. And a lot of what I've been talking about uh, thus far sort of feeds into this RDOC or research domain criteria idea that um, we should perhaps move away from symptom-based categories of disorders and try to integrate data across genetics, brain activity, and other um, markers to come up with data-driven categories of individuals who might be um, more amenable to a particular treatment strategy. And the reason, I mean, I think this goal of precision medicine and psychiatry is something we've heard about a lot about and we're all trying to move towards. But the main reason I put up this slide is because they, uh, Tom Insull and Cutbirth um, put insula cortex here in their diagram. And I have no idea if they have read all my work and take it very seriously, or if they just like threw a brain region into this figure for illustrative purposes. But I like to think um, that the understanding insula function and dysfunction is really key to um, understanding a lot of uh, brain pathology because it's just a key node in a key hub in, a, in one of these large scale brain networks that's involved across so many functions. So, um, you know, basically the, everything I've told you about is, is um, you know, using basic science, net, cognitive neuroscience and network neuroscience approaches to get a better handle on what we call executive functions and flexible behaviors in, in, in particular, because we think this will, you know, help us to better tailor treatments to, um, you know, to address inflexibility across both neurodevelopmental disorders and, um, you know, inflexible behaviors later in life. And, uh, you know, this is just a, um, you know, suggesting that once we, you know, help kids focus more on, uh, you know, basically their uh, interactions with the world and less on, you know, what they're wearing, perhaps on their feet, <laughs> this will be like helpful for kids with autism to, you know, to move about more independently in the world. Um, so this is my lab. This was taken back at the University of Miami a few years ago, and I'm lucky that a, a few of these folks were able to move with me. And on the right is um, one depiction of my collaboration network that I enjoy very much uh, engaging with and hope to only grow in terms of adding nodes and adding edges. Um, and here are some of the folks who I've worked with over the years who you know, provided data and code and resources and um, just uh, good input um, and some of the funding sources as well. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention is that, um, you know, I started my career at UCLA and Aron Zaydel was my first advisor and I was you know obviously sad to hear of his passing earlier in July. Um, so a few of his students, um, Eric Mushagan taking the lead here, have, have put together a call for a special issue on hemispheric specialization and interhemispheric interaction to honor his life and work and to pay tribute to him. So I'm really hoping that many of you in the community who um, knew Iran and knew about his you know his love of neuroscience um, will be able to contribute to this special issue. Um, so there's a uh, neuropsychology, um, there's a link to the special issue on their website. So I hope folks who are interested will take a look. And uh, thanks very much. I'm, I'm happy to be moving there in person next week. And I hope that will mean a lot more interaction with all of you in the near future. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Lucina. Great. Uh talk and also a great mention of uh, the guy that we all love around. Um, uh, any questions for Lucina? I think I see a raised hand from Nicole. Hi. Hi, Nicole, yep. Hi, I just wanted to say first, thanks for a great talk and we're really excited to have you at UCLA. Um, question about um, sort of translational approaches. So uh, my group is working on using uh, non-invasive brain stimulation in addiction therapies. And it's so cool to hear you talk so much about the insula and development because that's you know one of our goals is to try to modulate insula activity using non-invasive brain stimulation. So my question for you, which maybe I should know the answer to is, is that an approach that has been tried to modulate cognitive flexibility, especially in the context of neurodevelopmental disorders, trying to do that through non-invasive brain stimulation approaches? Yeah, that's a really great question. I mean, Marco right there is your TMS guy, so he can tell you that it's pretty hard to get at the insula through that approach. But I know some folks who are now using, I believe it's ultrasound um, to do stimulation, which I had not heard of until recently. It's really interesting to me that you can use that now to, to target deeper brain structures. 
So um, I am not the person to answer the question in terms of are, is it happening? But I, I know I know it is well, it is happening. I'm just not sure how far along it is in terms of efficacy and in terms of safety and in terms of all those things. But I think it's on the horizon for sure. Thanks. Jesse. Hi, Lucina. Wonderful Hi. talk as always. And we're so excited to have you here at UCLA. Um, I was wondering if you had any thoughts um, on, you probably haven't had a chance to, to read this sort of new uh, Trends in Cognitive Sciences article by Emily Finn yet. Maybe you did. It's, it's called, Is It Time to Put Rest to Rest? It just came out. And um, she basically is making the argument that resting state analysis has been incredibly useful for functional neuroimaging to map out these networks. And we've gotten a lot of traction by doing these analyses, but we sort of need to move on from it now and that it's such an unconstrained state and um, the idea that just sort of lying in the scanner looking at a blank screen um, is sort of something that you would do consistently within a subject and across subjects. Um, it's just, it's questionable. People's minds wander in different ways and go in and out. And so I wonder about the dwell time of certain cognitive states during rest. Clearly in your work you've shown is correlated with cognition outside of the scanner. So that's great. But like, what does it mean? Is it about the train of, of thought and how the thoughts meander from internal to external states to the extent that the singular percular sort of or insular network is the switchboard between internal and external cognition. How much do you think it matters sort of what people's minds are, are doing during rest and how still or restful their mind actually is? Yeah, I love this question. Thanks, Jesse. Um, and so I haven't had a chance to read that paper yet, but of course I saw it and it was a provocative title and I, I will definitely get to it. But I think, um, and I definitely agree, we have to do tasks in order to you know, tease apart what, what's actually going on when these systems are engaged in a particular way. But I, th I think what people often overlook or forget is that we're not saying necessarily that these intrinsic networks are related directly to ongoing cognition, because oftentimes we're looking at a frequency of 0 0.01, 0 0.1 to 0 0.01 hertz in the resting state analysis. So they're really low frequency fluctuations that are probably not linked to or directly underlying moment to moment cognition anyway. They may, they may shape the systems and have them be predisposed to respond in a certain way, but they're not, I think, the drivers of of active cognition in, in the way that you are measuring with tasks, you know, related fMRI. So I think it's it's fine to, you know, um, be wary about how much you can extrapolate from the resting state data to, you know, active cognitive processes. But um, I think most people who are working resting state fMRI would say that we were, we were never saying that, oh, we've solved all of cognition by looking at these intrinsic connectivity networks, but more that we're seeing there's these spontaneous fluctuations in the brain. They are, they're in the background always. They go at this low frequency and they probably predispose our brains to act in a specific way when you know stimuli are then presented. But I wouldn't equate them with cognition, you know, or, or ongoing cognition for, for many reasons. So I, I think I, I'll be very interested to, to read that paper carefully and, and um, you know discuss this further. But I think it's, it's a really right. important, important yeah. point. Do you think it's important if the person's even awake or asleep then? Oh <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. You can see some changes um, in resting state ne network architecture um, with sleep. There's been a number of papers on that. But it's, what's amazing is the consistency of, of the way the networks look, sleep, wake, anesthesia, even monkeys. Um, you know, so what's amazing is that this, this architecture seems to be somewhere in the background. And, and it can be, of course, modified by attention, arousal, sleep, consciousness, and all of these other things. So I think we're we're, um, we're at, a, at a place of, of finally beginning to integrate a lot of these different um, approaches. I, and I didn't mention this, but I think a lot of the animal work, um, calcium imaging and things like that really can help us uh, understand um, neur neural signal basis, uh, what, what's neural signal uh, versus what's noise and what's blood vessels and all these other things. So that's an exciting avenue as well. Thanks, Jesse. Okay, uh, I apologize, I don't know your name. Can you say your name before you ask your question? Sure, my name is Dhruv. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you for that talk. Uh, I feel like I learned a lot. Um, a quick question on one of the very early slides you showed. Uh, I believe it was showing the five different categories of brain activation, with one being the least active and five being the most active. 
Uh, and then you had a phrase, I think it was K means, and then not concentration, but something like that. I was wondering what that meant, as well as what you just meant on that slide. Yeah. At the top. Yeah. yeah, I apologize for going quickly through some methods things, but what I, what I was uh, referring to is K means clustering. It's just one particular algorithm for, um, you know, if you have a bunch of things of grouping them. So um, K means clustering lets you say, okay, there's a bunch of things, there's actually five categories or there's four categories or three categories. It's just a, a kind of one particular approach. But what I was um, showing is that, uh, you know, there, there could be many states that the brain kind of traverses through over the course of a certain period of time. And um, a clustering approach might tell you like, okay, it goes through these five states or these four states or these three states. And um, one of the ones we noted was a state in which all different areas of the brain were sort of loosely connected to each other. And a different state on the other end was when all different areas of the brain were tightly coupled or tightly connected to each other in terms of their communication. So I think um, one of the ways we think about it is that you know, different brain regions talk to each other you know, on different time scales, but um, is the way your brain wired up related to you know, your ability to do some kind of task, your ability to switch quickly between different processes, is that somehow related to the intrinsic architecture of these um, brain connections? So yeah, I apologize for going very quickly through some of the methods, but it's a good question. Thank you. Yes, you do so much that you can't really dig on. Well, I, I love methods. I love methods, but I don't want the whole talk to be about methods. So I'm always happy to follow up later on with, with these questions. Actually, I actually have a question for you, but I want to see if there are other people that have questions related to the, to the methods. It's a little bit off the wall question. Anyone else? <laughs> Okay, so here's my question. Yesterday or two days ago, three guys got the Nobel Prize in physics. And they had to do, some of their work had to do with climate change. Two of them really were really working on climate change. And the other guy who got half of the prize was this guy from Rome and who was very active in Rome when I was back in Rome, Giorgio Parisi. He's done a lot of work applying mathematical models of complex systems in all, pretty much everything, including the brain. How much of that work is actually used in the rest of state analysis? Yeah, so complex systems, I mean, well, a lot, yeah. <laughs> because, you know, the brain is a complex system. So, um, but what, what is surprising may be that a lot of the times the, the newest math or the newest physics or, you know, the newest uh, theories in one of those more basic fields takes a long time to trickle over to cognitive neuroscience um, because, I mean, I'm not an engineer, I'm not a physicist, but I have to rely on those folks to say, or computer scientists to say, oh, have you seen this new approach that works to, you know, to measure something related to climate change? We can apply it here to understand brain dynamics. And this happens a lot more increasingly because you're seeing, uh, you're seeing engineers, physicists, computer scientists collaborate a lot more closely with psychologists and neuroscientists. At least I've seen it a lot. And I think it's been great for the field because, um, you know, uh, things like, you know, uh, if you're doing computational modeling of any sort, you, um, you know, you can really use these theories from complex systems and network science. Um, and you can see it in every OHBM meeting every year, there's more and more of these, these um, kinds of con concepts being brought in to understand the brain. So um, I, I think that's, that's all good, right? <laughs> like, it's, it's only a matter of time before, you know, we, we can, uh, you know, really come together with these bringing these different fields together to answer this you know, complex problem. So yeah, it's, I think the more collaborative uh, we can be, the better. Okay, great. Any other question for Lucina? So, so Lucina, uh, Shantanu here, a very nice talk. I had a quick question. Uh, you showed a slide about uh, brain dynamics and, and flexibility across the lifespan. Uh, are, are all of those uh, healthy subjects or are yeah. controlled? Yeah, that was a healthy subject study. Um, and some of these data sets also include information about um, clinical diagnosis and other things. So for that study, we actually excluded anyone who had any kind of diagnosis. Uh, uh -huh. But yeah, it's something I didn't mention very much uh, throughout the talk is that there's many, many large data sets now available. So, you know, 10 years ago, we sat around collecting our own data and took forever, but now there's hundreds and thousands. There's something called the UK Biobank where there's literally hundreds of thousands of neuroimaging data sets. So a lot of these, um, what we call population neuroscience studies are becoming increasingly important because the sample sizes are large enough and well-powered and you have a really diverse uh, cohort. Um, so it, uh, this is sort of the future, I think, is, is uh, using these large data sets to answer some of these questions about cognition.
so i was i was wondering where uh, so you talked about autism children mm-hmm. with uh, asd and and where would the children with asd fit on on that curve or how how would their curve look like uh, uh, i, I don't yeah. know if somebody's done any work on that yeah so um the the couple slides i showed at the end were our attempts at looking at these um dynamic measures in kids with asd and they were of course much smaller samples but you know our initial studies did suggest things like a reduction in the number of brain state transitions in kids with autism. So that's why we try to do the work in the normative samples first to kind of understand the the general relationships between some brain dynamic and some behavior. And then we try to apply it again to a a cohort that's well characterized, um, for example, in autism. Of course, those are much smaller samples like I showed at the end, but but that's the idea is to use the basic neuroscience to then help us understand these disorders. Cool, thanks. Yeah, and thanks for the invitation. Well, if there is no other question for Rustina, I want to thank her. Great talk, uh, great uh, Q and A, and thanks everyone for uh, being part of the first uh, seminar of the fall series. We'll do more. Stay tuned. Thanks, Marco. Thank you.